So we're very fortunate today to be sitting down with Dr. John Mertz. Uh, John has been affiliated with the North Carolina Japan Center for many, many years, and he's the section coordinator of uh, Asian languages. Is that correct? Asian languages? I, no, of the Japanese language section. Uh, I co-coordinate the Asian language major with Dr. Nathaniel Isaacson, who does Chinese. Wonderful. Oh, and also Sujata Modi, of course, who does uh, uh, Hindi and Urdu. Uh, Wonderful. Which has, I think, one major, and then in Japanese, there are, I think, about 20 majors, and Chinese is getting close to that, too. And John, how many years have you been at NC State? Oh, golly, 30 years. 30 years. Wow. <laughs> well, we've been very lucky, continue to be very lucky to have you, and thank you for your support of the Japan Center. And you're also on our academic advisory committee, and uh, right. yes. thank you. And you're reviewing our Kelly Fund applications this semester. That is correct. For everything you do. We've already got one very strong application then, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to catch up with you, and uh, first I wanted to ask, how are things going with you and your classes switching back? You know, this week we had the news that everything's, mostly everything is switching on to, back to online. So well, um, I, I think it's a major inconvenience for students. Mm -hmm. I, I, in many ways, I mean, there's the basic way that they have to do all this on Zoom. And it's just not the same experience as an undergrad. Uh, mm -hmm or even a grad student, but especially for undergraduate students. Uh, I think it, it really gets in the way of what I would consider a good undergraduate education. And what that means for students is not just taking classes, but spending all hours of the night arguing about their classes and arguing about the big problems of life and the big, you know, arguing with each other, learning what the, what the limits are of their uh, they're roommates, and they're lucky if they've got great roommates. They may be even luckier if they have bad roommates <laughs> they, who they need to, to learn the skills from. Getting along. Right, yes. exactly. Life skills. I remember at the University yeah. of Delaware, I was in a triple, at, at, in a triple dorm room at oh. University of Delaware in Rodney dorm. So it was built for two kids. There were three of us in there. But I look back on that as uh, developing some very serious cohabitation skills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it's, it's not just cohabiting the, the room, it's cohabiting the earth. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a lot yeah. of it, a lot of the university experience about life skills. Right, right. Uh, now uh, for, uh, the, there's there's an up and a down to this. The, the, the upside is that uh, this era has enabled the BLM movement. It's enabled American society to see uh, in depth that had never been seen before uh, the condition of, you know, a good portion of the people who live in our society. Uh, and that is true just tremendously beneficial for our students if they can make it work for them, which, which means reading about it, talking about it, uh, you know, thinking, thinking it through as an issue, thinking through, you know, where are we as a society, where are we headed, uh, as just one of many, many problems. Exactly a year ago, as I was starting to teach, this was, you know, end of August, a year ago, uh, starting to teach a class on contemporary Japanese literature. I asked the students, as I always do, okay, so what are the big problems of the day? And the, you know, the big problem of the day was, was uh, what was it at the time? The Amazon was burning up, okay? I asked the same question back in January before it was clear that this pandemic was, um, um, was happening. And what was the problem? Oh, Australia is burning up, <laughs> okay? Well, yeah, that was... That was in the headlines, and now that, that, that was it. Okay, and nowadays, uh, I guess California is still burning up. The uh, the globe is still warming, and we are beset by so many different problems, major, major problems. Uh, so, for undergraduates, this should be a time when people are really thinking through the future of the Earth, because unlike any previous time that I've taught at NC State. 
uh, this is real, not just for me. I mean, it's, so, it's always been, I think, real for me in a way that I have to communicate it to students. I have to say, guys, you know, the, this, we're, we're, we are going to be burning up here, <laughs> okay? Um, this is the first semester where it's obvious. I don't have to, I don't have to be saying this. And uh, the downside is that everything is on Zoom and it's really hard to conduct discussions about that uh, at a distance. So, um, so, so here's where we are. It's a, it's a really interesting time. Yeah, no, I, I certainly wonder about, you know, once everything gets to whatever permutation of normal that we get to, right? Oh. How much of this is still going to be around, you know, in terms of distance learning, um, learning online? Is it going to be something that is mixed in with our traditional methodologies of in-person learning? Is it, I don't think really I've seen research in both directions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, well, you know, you can't re really research something that's, that's growing. We don't see the eventuality. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly um, right. And and there's no way we can foresee what some of those eventualities will be. My prediction is that there's an awful lot of the technology here that's that is here to stay and will grow as uh, you know as time goes on. I, I'm looking at you via Zoom. To be honest, the the um, the definition isn't very good. I get better definition on Apple FaceTime when I talk with my wife, who's in Japan right now. Uh, that's that's all going to be getting better and as it gets better it'll mean more people on the screen clearer sounds uh, uh you know a better sense of actual communication uh and another thing that's probably not very good on zoom is all the ancillary is like sharing files it's not like you can't do it it's just not very good so for example with my japanese language classes uh i I have a Zoom channel, which I conduct the classes in, but then we have a back channel and we're doing it on Discord. And it's great because a student, you know, their connection may pop out. They have ways of getting to the Discord channel. Discord is essentially like, like Zoom. It's just, uh, rather than the video, it's, it's more heavily text oriented. It allows sharing of files more easily. It allows you just to, you know, you type in a little message saying, I missed that. What's the document? What page are we on? You know, that sort of thing. And uh, at the same time, it's not so private as to, uh, uh, as to encourage, you know, like, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> Level of discussion, which you might find in a, in a classroom, you know, with students exchanging notes. I, I don't know. It's, it, it's good. I like it. I, I also like, I have always I have always liked the chaos of a classroom because chaos is what you know brings people together it lets it's what lets people know that oh so, somebody over there is thinking something different or thinking something you know contrary or thinking you know or maybe exploring a tangent which takes it a step further or or whatnot um so uh uh I, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying the experiment, and I hope it doesn't last too long. <laughs> so. It doesn't have to be an either or, it can be an and. I, uh, yeah, really another part of it that I think is, I mean, you know, thinking about when this pandemic has happened, mm -hmm. what would we be, what kind of instructional, if any, framework would we be, we'd be looking at if it had happened in the 80s? Right or even oh, okay. or even just the beginning of the two thousands. I don't think that we'd have the necessary infrastructure no. to be That's able. Right. To, That's you right. know? Uh, well, you know, so long as you're there in this in this science fiction sense, it would also have been a time without uh, without the good genetic analysis that we do nowadays. That's they true. can they can identify. Oh, here's a here's a strain that came from this place, or here's a strain that, that came from that place. Um, yeah. And uh, so uh, the technology of, you know, face masks, or what is going on with face masks? What is going on with the transmission and the little droplets and things like that? I think we are, we're in a much better technological position to make those assessments. 
we are not in a good political position because we're in a situation right now, everything has become so polit politicized that it, you can't even wear a mask outside without turning it into some kind of a statement. And I, I really am disappointed with that. Um, yeah, and, it, and, it's all, and it's something that, that our students also, our students need to be thinking about as part of their undergraduate experience so that they can walk away from this saying, I have been there, we cannot let this happen this sort of thing happen again. We have to pay attention to the science. We have to, you know, do this, that, and the other thing. Um, I don't know that our students will be able to walk, walk away from this with that wisdom. And, and yeah. it's one thing that worries me. Well, you know, I, uh, I do have faith that we'll see the other side of this. And um, oh. right, we ha it has to be worth it in terms of learning the lessons that we need to learn. Yep. carry into the future. Yep. There's another aspect that I... Oh, we had a bit of a stutter there. That's okay. The, and when, when, <laughs> when I teach Japanese language, um, it, it's, you know, basic language stuff. Okay, so I, we don't have much opportunity to talk about the big issues. Uh, but I also teach literature classes. And in those classes, we do have a chance. Even if it's 16... 16, 1700s Japanese literature, uh, the, the problems of environmental collapse, the, inv the problems of uh, one caste lording it over another caste within a society are very much present. Sure. Uh, so many of the problems we face. And uh, likewise, the problems of institutions. Uh, so people get involved in institutions and it gets really hard to make tough decisions. Uh, we right now, as a university, we're faced with tough decisions. Do we open the university or do we close the university? Uh, I think a whole lot of students have been not just inconvenienced, but uh, potentially a lot worse than that. Having been told, please come back to the university with the faculty saying, oh my God, no, you cannot be doing this. And, and then the students all come back to the, you know, okay, wonderful, they're all back, let's teach a couple of classes. Then we have an outbreak, nobody, as if nobody could have seen that. And now they all are sent back home, having been infected with COVID, to reinfect their parents, their grandparents, something like that. This is a absolute disaster, but it's an institutional disaster. It happens not not because NC State is bad or because the U.S. is bad. It's because this is what happens with institutions. People get really wrapped up in the the desire, the need to perpetuate, you know, whatever is going on in the institution. The the classes perpetuate the dormitories, perpetuate the the economics of if we don't have students here. What's going to happen to the cleaning staff? Are they not going to have jobs if they lose their jobs? Uh, what happens to their uh, to their apartments that they're living in if they can't pay their rent? What happens then? What happens? So all of these things, you know, cascade. And um, so rather than using this as an opportunity to just point the finger at one person or another within the institution or within the political framework, I think it's a it's an opportunity to think about how, how institutions are so complexly bound uh, and tied up within, each, within themselves that when something big happens, we are, we are in deep, deep trouble. You know? and, uh, and it's true of COVID, it's true of the environment, it's true of race relations. Uh, those are the big three that I'm seeing right now. There's maybe more than that going on. No. Well, I mean, this is something that we're seeing, certainly not just here at NC State, we're seeing this nationwide. At many, Absolutely. Many, many worldwide. Worldwide. Of course, yes, worldwide. Worldwide. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that we were talking about, just to switch gears a little bit recently, yep. that I really thought was incredibly interesting and uh, was your assessment of... And I think this is a continuously evolving thing of, you know, how we view f learning and teaching foreign languages, right? The, the, the 
pedagogy of that, you know, understanding what is really the most efficient way to both teach and learn a uh, right. language that is not already embedded within us as our, our native language. And I just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, ha having been doing this for about 30 years, and I, I, I think there's a lot to be said uh, in terms of the general trends of American teaching, but also in terms of the very recent, you know, so now everybody's living virtually, we're all on Zoom, uh, that sort of thing. For quite a while now, my students have been living, especially the students of Japanese, have been living semi-virtual lives. They come to Japanese out of an interest. First, it was manga, you know, back in the, in the 1990s. Uh, anime, maybe around the same time, uh, sort of catching on and on. Uh, early 2000s, uh, into the mix comes games, you know, the Sony PlayStation stuff. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and then there are all the sort of the ancillary media expressions, the artistic expressions of whatever it is, K-pop, J-pop, you know, that, that sort of thing. There's tremendous uh, at a distance, uh, what is it, artistic experiencing that's going on by our students. Okay. And they say they want to learn Japanese, okay? And so you wonder, okay, so what Japanese do you want to learn? Uh, now, if you, if you back up prior to that, say even prior to the 90s, you know, go back to the 19, late 1940s, um, uh, there was a major shift in American uh, language teaching uh, with the beginnings of the so-called audiolingual method. And uh, now I trace that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the history of this, but I think it had to do with the fact that my father's generation, my father having been a New York guy, my mother as well, New York uh, woman, they grew up in the city, born in Queens, whatever, uh, 19, late 1920s, okay? Yeah. They were brought up with a, under the Latin and Greek regime when it came to foreign languages. If and, you were learned, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, they, they were learned in that, okay? Mm -hmm. You get to the end of the war and this new generation sa is saying, look, we've got Europe, we've got <laughs> Japan and so forth. Do we really wanna be doing Latin and Greek when Europe is out there? When a whole airline out industry is out there? When we can be sending our wonderful Americans to be go ordering, uh, you know, sitting at Paris bistros or whatever the <laughs> cafes, yeah. uh, you know, ordering, ordering in French from a menu. And wouldn't that be cool? Uh, cool all around, cool politically, because it shows the Europeans that these rapacious capitalists from America are actually nice people, okay? Um, and so, so you get that level, which changes the idea of foreign languages and foreign language learning. Uh, to the sense that, hey, let's be teaching some French. Uh, and then later after that, maybe some German, maybe some Italian, maybe, and then uh, after that, as Spanish becomes more important, for the purposes of just jabbing, you know, jabbering with people, <laughs> whatever, just gabbing with people. Um, and I have an image you know, of Berlitz, like the Berlitz tapes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the so, image, you, yeah, with the headphones on, you're just, so, yeah. Hey, what time is it? Yeah, Let's yeah. go get a coffee. What's on the menu here? That kind of thing. Um, so you, so the, the idea of foreign language teaching sort of reoriented itself to that perspective. Um, now, what, what got lost was the idea that, hey, grammar can be complex. It can be really interesting. And you really need to get it in order to get your messages precise. Uh, so... Uh, so what, what was lost was the idea that, you know, at, you can make a mistake if you go to a bistro uh, and it's, it's just no big deal. You, you order something else and, and you have a wonderful surprise and you pay $30 extra, whatever. I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what, what you can't deal with is, is uh. a nuclear strike. <laughs> yes, there can't be mistranslation, there can't be a miscommunication, yes. Right. 
and and there are trade deals there are, there are whatever military deals there there's all kinds of stuff where you really want to get it right and if you know if you do history if you do literature um th there's just uh, maybe it's not so important with literature, but you still want to get it right. You make it important. It's an it's an art form, and you want to have it right. And also, just as one little aside, John, uh, one little yeah. side that I think is very very interesting. And please return yeah. to what you were saying is that you're one of the only people that I know who's not a native speaker of, of Japanese, but is incredibly obviously proficient. That who has said to me, Japanese is an incredibly precise language. Oh, absolutely. 99% of the people who I interact with, again, who are not Japanese, yeah. say, oh, well, there is this concept of, of uh, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a high context culture that this comes from. And so there are things that are left unsaid. You have the I, my concept of, you know, the, sure, but sure. I want to hear your opinion on this because uh, it's okay. very, so, very so interesting. You read, yeah, so you read a novel and uh, you translate a novel. Now, English grammar, this is back to a grammar point, requires predicates to have subjects. Even if the subject is it, it is raining. Well, who's it? Nobody knows who it is, but, but uh, in Japanese it's not required and things like subjects and so forth often get, let, get left out. It doesn't mean it's ambiguous. It just means it's left out of the sentence, okay? Now, there are ambiguities, but the ambiguity, if you're good at dealing with ambiguities, you should know that it's either A or B, not, not it's A or B or, or mishmash somewhere else. It's, it's gonna, that ambiguity is going to be an A versus B, or maybe A versus B versus C. The mishmash of ambiguity just doesn't enter the picture. Okay? And that's, I, I, I think there's confusion on that issue when it comes to the idea of ambiguity. So, so there is a necessity for learning precision, for learning grammar in the, in the language. And I just think it's something that, that people need to uh, not dismiss so easily when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to that. Now, I've heard people say, say, oh, you know, if I want to learn a language, I would want to hang around with people and just talk with people and you sort of, you pick up the words and you pick up the phrases and you make it work for you. And, you know, there may be a certain level of truth to that with very close languages like English versus Spanish or English versus French or even closer French versus Italian or something like that, you know. Yeah, more like a romance language based. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right there. Because, because the little details are become very quickly, very easy to negotiate. You know exactly what what's going on. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, some exceptions to that. There are exceptions, but but by and large, with Japanese, no, just no way. It's uh, the 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 syntax of the language, the way you order the words is different. The sounds of the words are different. The origins of the words. This this three thousand five hundred year deep history that links Japanese with Chinese. Um, and makes it a bottomless abyss of just wonderful historical and cultural reverence. Um, uh, the, there, is, there is no comparison, the, the, there's nothing to hold on to that exists in English that can, uh, that can give you access to that. It, me it means you, you're generally starting from zero. Um, but that's also a really interesting thing about language because, you know, what, one of the aspects of undergrad, the undergraduate experience, which, for which I think language is really cool and indispensable, is that it teaches you something about the human relation between your body and your language, between the reality and the language. Oh, yes. And, yes. And at, a, at a philosophical, but also at a phil physical level, it's really cool to get that. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people have the, the sense, I mean, I really, it was fascinating when you were talking about this, that Japanese is a very precise language. It's just understanding where the precision is located. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people get this concept that in comparison to English, which is, I don't think, probably a very good relationship to make in any case, that 
you have a Japanese, I mean, just in general, you'll have someone who you're, you know, is a, a Japanese national. This is a, a, an example that was given to me once by my teacher. And they will say something such as, you know, it's kind of cold in here. And a normal, you know, perhaps in a very generic way, a Japanese person is going to be looking around. Is there a window open? Is there a door is open? Should I turn up the thermostat? Right. But yeah. us so, in English or an American. Oh, yeah, it's cold in here, meaning uh, can't you help me do something about exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. But perhaps from our point of view, again, in a very generic way, yeah. someone might say, you know, could we turn up the thermostat a little bit? Or yeah. Yeah. let you be more direct. But it doesn't really have to do with the language. That has more to do with the culture. Yeah. yeah. And language is a very is sort of a, on, on attached to that, right? That the way that we use the language, but not the language itself, maybe. Oh. Um, the yeah. other thing that you were talking about in, in this, in what you're talking about here in terms of this, this evolution of how we've taught language before, right? And how, how it is now. I had the impression before when we talked that you are uh, a supporter of really getting back to like literary forms uh, of not just, you know, of course, the, 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 aud the auditory communication parts okay. and understanding spoken language, but really actually sitting down and getting into, as you teach, Japanese literature, right. seeing how yeah. grammar is yeah. from that. Yeah, so to pick up another thread from this idea of uh, Zoom culture and virtual culture, uh, my own experience, when I go to Japan, uh, my wife and I have a place that's right outside of uh, Tokyo. And, uh, you know, I, I just love living there and, you know, cooking there and going to the stores and things like that. Do I talk to people? Well, I talk to my wife. I talk to the guy down the street who sells coffee. When I need to, I will go talk to the people, you know, to renew, renew my driver's license or whatever it is. Uh, but by, uh, and maybe I'll uh, go to my wife's laboratory every once in a while and talk to some of her colleagues. We'll go out for dinner or something like that. And that's great. But the, the great proportion of my life is spent reading reading newspapers, reading novels, reading, uh, you know, journals or whatever, uh, uh, or even on, uh, maybe if I'm watching television, uh, uh, I, I can watch something that's voice only. But I tell you, if, I, if I'm not literate, it's really hard to understand adult Japanese, okay? Uh, uh, we don't have kids. So, so kids Japanese, you know, I, I guess over the years I, I've learned about kids Japanese. It's, it's a whole different territory. <laughs> yeah, I never, my students when I was there in Japan, I had no idea what they were talking about. But, I but, so I, li I live in a world of, of educated language, which is very primarily, it, it, its foundation is, is writing. And I think that if we're going to teach students Japanese for the purposes of anything having to do with the future that, that connects back to Japan, we need to not give short shrift to the, to the reading and writing component. And it does take a lot of work. Uh, it, uh, what that work is, to begin with, instead of 25 letters of the alphabet, you've got, you know, a couple thousand kanjis, uh, whatnot. A couple thousand? Actually, Is it a couple thousand? Or, or four or five thousand. <laughs> well, at least the Joyo Kanji, if you want to be able to be basically literate. The, right. the high, what you need to graduate Japanese high school. Right. Yes. So, so now what does that require? Uh, it actually requires a neural network of a lot of learning and a lot of neurons getting nurtured and built up. And that takes time. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And it's every step of the way is immensely rewarding, but, but it's, it is work. Um, it's not something that can be given short shrift. Uh, let's say I was about to, uh, I mentioned how I think this is really cool for as an undergraduate experience to let people know that yes, you are building neurons. You can build neurons. Even if you're 20 years old, even if you're 40 years old, you can build ne those neurons. And uh, you know, you spend the time and it works. 
language isn't the only way of doing that. I mean, learning a musical instrument, for example, I think is absolutely wonderful for teaching people the, the body-mind nexus. Um, I, besides music, I, I would say that language offers the, the additional uh, advantage of teaching people that language and reality are really not the same. That, you know, when we look at a scientific equa equation, to take, to take the, the most direct analogy of this, we look at a scientific equation, it is not the reality itself. It is a, an attempt to use something that is humanly accessible, visually, cognitively, to show something that's going on in reality. Uh, and, and at that, an incredible reduction thereof. So, um, so teaching language, you know, sort of gets at this idea, gets at this separation. And I think it's really indispensable to a, to a good education. You know, I think, yeah, and very well, well, well said. Um, one of the things that I tend to, uh, to or I continually struggle with, with, mm -hmm. you know, it has less to do with the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the Japanese language, but it has more to do with how culture is inextricably connected to language. And whether it's an extension of it or um, anything like that. I mean, we know in Japanese that there, anyone who is at, usually towards the beginning stages of learning Japanese and goes to Japan and they're at a stoplight and they're about to cross the road and they hear the, the, the announcement that, what, what do we usually hear, Dr. Mertz, when we're about to cross the road in the, you know, what with this? <laughs> well, Shingo wa Ao ni narimashita. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, now right. we're thinking right. to ourselves in my literal translation of English to Japanese, which happens at the beginning, right? Is that's right. It's a blue traffic light? Where, oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Where is the blue traffic light? Right. And understanding later from your friends, your teachers, well, in Japanese, blue and green are yeah. used in some instances interchangeably. I, you know, I actually well, learned out to begin with as, as green. Oh, okay. Been, All right. And I have been corrected by my students saying, no, it's not green, this is blue. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Well, Midori is green or, yeah. yeah it's, it's, and it's, it's so fascinating. <laughs> it really is a fascinating thing. I mean, the first time I heard about Aoringo, uh, uh, that's just a green apple. It could be a Granny Smith apple. Right. It's a green apple. Right. Or, or an first, unripe apple, yes. Or an unripe apple. Yeah, but I'm thinking in my apple. brain, yeah. What is this cool blue space apple that I didn't know about that's in Japan, you know? Right, 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 right. And there's a lot of really cool books um, about this. There's like uh, something about like the Japanese that even Japanese people don't know. Like there's these books that you can get. And it explains sort of the history of why that happened. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's really two degrees of thought here that I've seen from people who are learning Japanese. There are ones who really want to get to the bottom of why things happen in language, right? Oh. Why? Why is it that way? Yeah. There's other people who say, doesn't matter, just do it. Oh. I've seen that. Yeah. I well, it, you know, this might be too technical, but um, uh, there is depth in two directions. Uh, ling linguists uh, uh, use the term synchronic and diachronic. Uh, diachronic having to do with the historical origins of a word or whatever it is of a formation in language. Uh, and uh, synchronic, having to do with how it fits into the system. And synchronicity is really interesting. You, you think that that's, well, it is what it is. But in fact, language is an interlocking system that, that locks into itself in ways such that something that happens over here can affect something that, something that exists here. So uh, you get modern verb forms, and pretty soon all the verb forms are taking the same verb form. And you, maybe you get a couple historical vestigial forms that, that last. Uh, these vestigial forms abound in Japanese. And for students who just take modern Japanese and say, oh, I'm not interested in classical Japanese, you're going to hit a wall sooner or later because the, the vestigial forms build up and build up and build up 
to the point where you've got to say, no, there's a, there's a classical system going on here. And if you can learn that, if you can learn the synchronicity of that system, then you can come back to learn the synchronicity, synchronicity of the modern system. You know, I, you picked up on something really um, that I wanted to just, I know we're kind of running out of time, but I, I, there's, we've seen numerous editions of not only the, 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 usually what, you know, universities are using is what I use was the Genki series of books, right? To, yeah, to, yeah. to right. Learn Japanese. Right. Now we're getting into the third edition of Genki. I think I was on the first edition. And one thing that is sort of, I guess, in a, in a nerdy way for me is I love seeing the differences between those editions. What did they change? And you see from like, I, I have not I have yet to see the third edition. I know I'm excited. Came out. To we're see still it. we're still working on the second edition in our curriculum because we had to sort of uh, bite the bullet and come to a decision just at a time right before it had come out. And then right after that it came out and became available. Um, so probably for a year from now we'll be working on third edition. And I too am very curious. I'm very curious because yeah. there are a few things where people are taking away like anachronistic language, right? As someone might say it's anachronistic. I think you should learn it all. But so, so from like the, the first edition to the second edition, you might see that they changed like the, the word for pager to the word for oh, yeah. cell phone or something like that. Right. Like, <laughs> right. No one uses so you a pager. Pagers to cell phones and cell phones to smartphones. Smartphones, like smahal yeah. or yeah. Right. So and and uh, what is it? Personal computers to laptop computers. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. That's right. And uh, there is something that I've seen just within this the 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 time that I've spent learning Japanese, right? And I find it to be a a, a process that's never over. That right, right. I think uh, more interestingly, uh, you know, a lot of that is coming up. I'm teaching this semester a first year class, and partly for the purposes of just getting through you know the basics of the language we'll ask people okay what is your you know what is your nationality what is your gender what is your some of these questions are getting you know really iffy you don't want to be going there you just don't want to be going there and uh so are we going to say well let's do it anyhow that's what that's what i'm doing with my students i said Okay, we're doing this for the purpose of language, but in real society, you don't want to ask people's age. You don't want to be messing with that too much. Uh, on the point of gender, uh, there, there are gender pronouns that are starting to become problematic uh, in Japan. Uh, women, uh, I've heard this already many times, and this goes back at least a decade, referring to themselves with masculine pronouns. And it doesn't necessarily refer to sexual preference or sexual identity it's it's just messing with general cultural identity but then on top of that you get the sexual preference stuff the sexual uh, identity stuff the gender identity stuff and and we're in a, a a territory where people really need to be careful and really need to be rethinking through you know, the kinds of things that can be said and how to say them and that, that sort of thing. Uh, so you're saying like, instead of saying something like atashi, which would be like a feminine I. Old style hyper feminine atashi. Uh, yeah, or it's changing to like boku or. Right, right. So, okay. so young women. Masculine or traditionally women, masculine. Or, pr precisely. So young women who wish to avoid that hyper feminine. You know, another aspect of hyper feminine speech uh, used to be things like covering the mouth speaking in a very high high pitched voice or when they when uh, they would laugh right 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 okay yes. um or or little things like you know maybe an over enunciation of this at the end this uh, uh, yeah pronouncing right. the ooh, um, yes yeah. or or even just modern speech where um uh, you go into 24-hour stores right now. I, I bring this up because my wife just brought it up with me as a native speaker of my age, of course. You know, she's, um, uh, she goes into a 24-hour store. Why do they always end with that lilt up? Oh, how goes that? It's the kind yeah. of thing that, that uh, pushes generational buttons. Well, uh, it's not that it should exist or shouldn't exist. It does exist, and it right. does push buttons. And you need to, you need to know whose buttons are where. Um, <laughs> you know, they, I've, I've also heard. I mean, there are some um, things about you know even 
I shouldn't say even. You're right. I mean, this is all part of how language evolves. And a lot of people don't think about that. Languages change over time. And it takes a lot quicker than a lot of people think it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. When I was first oh, oh, it years, does. It's very quick. Um, you know, like, I, I have a recording. It's on a 45 record of my mother uh, who recorded a Christmas message, message to my grandfather, 1945. Wow. She's speaking like, um, what language is that? Is, was that like a Hollywood? <laughs> and be, because I've heard people in the old films who used to speak like that. Oh, um, there's a name for that accent. It's like trans, transatlantic or something like that. There is like, I know what you mean. Like, it, yes, yes. Like Grant would, would, would talk in that. She, she was speaking in 19, 1945 New York. <laughs> Right. Yeah, uh, it's it's really. I mean, because even when I was first in Japan, you'd hear phrases like that. Yeah, you'd have to be. You, you should be careful now. Saying like O L, right? O L, office lady. Right. That's that's. You don't really hear that all, as much as you used to now. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Or something like salaryman. Salaryman. Uh, salaryman. salaryman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does the sal salaryman? Does uh, how robust is this concept even? given the uh, destruction of unions, given the, uh, basically the, uh, the re it's not a, even an official repeal, but the going by the wayside of labor regulations that gave people lifetime jobs. Sure. Um, that, that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, the going by the wayside of the hierarchical system within the companies. Mm. Um, a lot of that's uh, been on its way out for, for better or for worse. Uh, and, and we're left with a society where so much of that, you know, it is, uh, is left being really questionable for somebody teaching language. Now, a, a big thing, the honorific system, old days honorifics. Young kids were supposed to address their, their elders with respect. Elders were supposed to be, you know, inclusive and be less formal to, to the younger generation and therefore sp speak with a lower level of, of um, uh, this honorific distality, as, as it might be called. Okay. And yet, uh, 22 years ago, I was, a full 22 years ago, I was with my wife at Tokyo University uh, Medical Center. There were graduate students speaking to the teacher. They spoke to the teacher in the most rude and informal form. Not even saying, hey, masu desu form? Like no, no, forget that. Uh, oh, so, hey, you ate lunch yet? To which the teacher being of an older generation responded, yes, I, I have partaken of my lunch or whatever it was. <laughs> and, and by the way, to, for, for those of us, those people who are watching this, Tokyo University is a big deal. That's, it's not- uh, it's, Tokyo University is a, a big deal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so there was this <laughs> jarring, uh, everything was wrong about this conversation. Um, and yet it was what it was. And I don't think the students realized what was going on. I don't even think the professor realized what was going on. He was speaking with the, the dialect that he had been taught, which is proper for Tokyo University, you know, for somebody there. They were teaching the dialect that they had been taught, you know, going to high school and college mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you're left with a system that is so deeply vestigial, it's lost its it's a synchro it's synchronic grounding for this is this is what this means this is what that means you use this language and you use it to your superior you use that language and you use it to your inferior uh, that's uh, that's in a kind of a mishmash state right now and it's not ambiguous it's all over the place I'm way. really interested to see, yeah, in the next, I mean, I'm always interested to see that this, this kind of transformation. I mean, oh. getting back to the, the Genki textbooks, yeah. I was first edition, and they were just starting to talk about the transition in potential form, 
Right. Of, 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 I mean, this might, again, this is technical for. Uh, yeah, that's right. Taberdade, ta the old style. Right. Right. To be able to style. eat, right, right is right. now turning right. into things like taberdade, which is. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But even in that edition, that first edition said, this is considered to be a not official way to do this, but it's right. a colloquial way to do it. Right. It's a little bit saying a little bit colloquial, a little bit undereducated. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was pretty clear what they were saying. Now, yeah. by the time you get to the second edition, it's more accepted. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen in the third edition. They might say, well, you're both are equal, or this is actually gaining prominence, right? Well, yeah. if you watch contemporary media, it's mm -hmm. pretty much taken over. Um, yeah. uh, this, is, uh, this is what it is now. And um, so, so what do we teach to the students? Well, in fact, what we have to teach is not one thing, but a lot of things. We have to teach many different registers. And I think that's something that gets also short shrift in language classes, uh, probably short shrift in the ESL, the English as a spoken language classes. You know, uh, there are many different registers that people use when they speak English. And, uh, Learning to negotiate that takes, uh, takes some work. I, I agree. Well, John, thank you so much for making time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. It's always a, a, a great honor. Uh, thank you. Time for a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, the, I really wanted our audience to know more about you and about you know, what we're teaching at NC State University, and, um, but especially your thoughts about this uh, the way that things change in, in especially Japanese teaching and learning. And, you know, I think that these are all things that should remain at the forefront of our minds when we're not only trying to learn or teach Japanese, but other languages or trying yeah. to challenge ourselves to learn more. No. no. So thank no. you so much it's, for your time. It, I really it's, it's, part of, it's part of a world experience. You know, uh, language is just one of many, many things that needs to get you know, put into place. For that. Absolutely. Well, please yeah. do take very uh, Jonathan, care. Jonathan, thank you so much. I, I enjoyed your questions. I enjoyed our discussion. Uh, and yes. uh, let's say, um, to the audience out there, greetings. Come study Japanese. At yes, please. Yes. 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 <laughs> and your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and friends and, and whatnot. Yes. Uh, send them to the North Carolina Japan Center, which has uh, Japanese language classes that are very accessible and very well taught. Thank you. And, uh, and please send them to, uh, to NC State. And uh, I hope this, uh, this era of Zoom and coronavirus will be over soon. Well, please take good care, John. Thank you so much for taking okay. okay. Thanks, Jonathan.